so I'm a, a student of history, and a student of history likes to tell stories. And no story for a history student is complete without a date. For today's story, I choose a very specific date, a very important date in my life. 12th of August, 2010. I am in Dehriki, uh, northern Sindh, tucked away by the Indus River. And as fairy tale like I'm scoring a picture I'm trying to paint here, it's not. It was blazing hot in summer. It was like a desert hot. Uh, but there were some blessings to count there. One of the most important ones was that it was the first of Ramadan of that year. And there are other bless blessings that come with Ramadan, such as a food-filled table around evening time where family comes together, sits around, and we have <clears throat> a great iftar. But at that time, my family was sort of highly invested in stocks. So we, our favorite channel those days was Business Plus. And while we watched Business Plus and we had iftar, uh, breaking news came up. And uh, it said that uh, two killed and three injured in an event of target killing in Karachi today. Um, to be honest, we weren't really surprised, as we should have been, but because it was a common occurrence those days, 2010 was probably one of the most deadliest years uh, for Shia target killing since 1995. And uh, my dad, in a very naive moment, sort of commented that, uh, well, you know, it's it's actually probably one of the other blessings of Ramzan that uh, this number has come down from 20, 25, 30, even some days, to a handful or less. And uh, in all our uh, casual moments, we, we were like, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, just do. Great. We are doing good now. Uh, two hours passed, and unfortunately, as we all tend to forget uh, such news and uh, it is kind of sad too, but we all forget about it. And I was at a gym. I don't look like I go to gym, but at that time I did. But yeah, I was at a gym and my cousin called. Uh, I took up the phone and uh, he said in a very broken voice that uh, Zaya, uh, uncle, has been shot in the streets of Karachi. And I was like, who? He's like, Sayyid Fayal Sencha. So Sayyid Fayal Sencha was one of those people who was injured that night. And that changed the whole perspective. That changed the whole news that I got that day. Let alone those who were injured, I had forgotten about those who were killed. And it was not about one person anymore. It was not about two people anymore. It was about a whole family. It was about me. It was my family, 100 people from my family and other families. And this, this sort of statistic, you know, that we've sort of made out of uh, deaths these days, like, you know, 250 people died. Oh, that's not a big number. Oh, as long as it's not 5,000 or more, it's not a big number. It is every single death is a big number. And Stalin happens to say that one death is a tragedy while millions is just a statistic. We are just on that road. We are on that road of calling million deaths a statistic. So of all those things that happened, the whole next month we spent in ICUs, corridors of Afan University Hospital and Yakut Nation and whatnot, and on the day, right before Eid, we, I remember I was entering cafeteria. The Eid moon was sighted, and I was entering cafeteria in the Afan University Hospital. And someone came back from behind. And before I could break my fast, he told me that, my brother told me that, uh, that uncle had passed away. While the whole country was happy and celebrated Eid, we, on the other hand, uh, were celebrating Eid in a very different way, in a very unusual way. My uncle, well, not celebrated, but he had his last Eid in a coffin on our shoulders in the city of Tatta, where he's buried and rests in peace today. May God bless his soul. But one thing that really came out of all that happened, a lot of emotions and everything came in, but one emotion that held really closely to me was the idea of separation. And it is not a very, only a human thing. It, if, you, if we go into Sufism and other things, it's, it's a very important emotion to hold on to. Jalaluddin Rumi put, puts it in a really beautiful way when he opens his Masnavi. There's this translation I've pulled up. Uh, he says that, Bishnu in ne chu shikayat me kunat, as judo yaha hikayat me kunat, kaz ni stan ta marob bari dea, 
از نفیرم مرد و زن نا لہندے ہن سینا ہوئے خواہم چرا چرا از فراق تا بگویم چرا درد اشتیاق لسن ٹو دا ریڈ ہاؤ اٹ ٹیلز اے ٹیل کمپلیننگ آف سیپریشن سیپریشن از اے ویری امپورٹنٹ موشن اینڈ ون تھنگ دیٹ ریئلی بادرڈ می واز دا فیکٹ دیٹ اٹ واز بیکاز آف ریلیجن دیٹ سم ون ہیڈ کلڈ مائی انکل ہی واز اے شیا سم ون کلز ہیم جسٹ بیکاز ہی از شیا اینڈ آئی واز forced to question myself, what is religion? Is religion telling me that the one God that made me has also asked other people to kill me because I follow a certain religion? And the honest thing to do was to Google it, and I tried. It didn't really answer my question, though. But, well, I, I tried. Uh, it says that, you know, there's supernatural thing and gods and everything, but didn't really question, answer my question. The second question I was, asking myself was, what to do with religion? Because all the religions sort of tear me apart. Like, one takes you this way, the other takes you that way. What do I do with religion? And a common answer to that, that I was sort of also contemplating on was, you know, throw it away. You know, I don't know, I don't want religion, if this is what it does. But let's go back to the question of what is religion. And over the, pa over the past four years, while I studied economics and history at LUMS, and I went abroad to study religion. I also was really inquisitive about religion all throughout my academic career. And one thing that I really learned was the definition of religion, of all other things. One thing that I think was really important is the definition of religion. Religion, essentially, a Latin word means to bind. To bind human to God, and to bind human to human. And this is the definition that I follow. It is that when anything that makes, takes me away from humanity or takes me away from God is not religion. So I spent the next four years at LAMS and I think of all other things that happened, I found all my mentors at LAMS, I all found my, all my partners at LAMS, all of them are sitting around here and I'm probably thinking they were the ones cheering. And we sort of, I sort of found myself back in a school in Karachi on 13th of August, 2010. 2014, four years, exactly four years after that incident. And while it seems like I had planned it to be that way, but trust me, it was not. It was just something I called retrospect perfect that I happen to have a story now. So yeah, so I was in Karachi in Leari, one of the most conflict-ridden areas of Karachi. And uh, like my mother would always, you know, few me a some, some few times with some duas and stuff like, go safe, come back safe every day, like literally. So we went in, I didn't know what to do, but all I knew that I had to talk about bringing people together. I had to talk about tolerance, empathy, peace, something that really mattered at this point in time. It was a pressing issue in Pakistan. It currently is a pressing issue in Pakistan. I did a month long thing there and my partners at that time were in Gilgit and Hunza doing something very similar. And we came back and sat down in Lahore around September and we got incubated as a social innovation lab. And we decided to call ourselves rubbish. Rubbish means a path. It's a Persian word which means a path that we feel go, leads to global peace, harmony, and tolerance. Um, so we became a social enterprise, and I'm very particular about why it's a social enterprise, because we're not an NGO. We work for a good cause, but we also are a business. And we became a social enterprise that works for peace building, conflict resolution, through promotion of empathy and tolerance. These are our core values, tolerance, empathy, and conflict resolution. And a lot of people started questioning me, how can you possibly go and teach someone to be tolerant or empathetic? And I was like, that's a great question. I'm still finding the answer. So over the next three to four months, we just we sat down and made a whole curriculum that started off by very simple things, like reading Cinderella. We read Cinderella with students, and then we see how the story changes when you change the character of the story. And when you look at it from a different perspective, we introduce the idea of difference of opinion. And then we also introduce how we all are part of a story. You are one character, I am one character, the person in the back is another character. Everyone is in the same story, but have a different view on it. So we go on to the ideas of culture. What is culture? How do we understand culture? How do we understand tolerance, empathy, and all these notions. And once we've established that, we go into practicing empathy. 
and tolerance. We connect with people from around the world. We have, and we have partners in China, Japan, Germany, and almost 10 different countries who Skype or come into classes and talk about their culture, their religion, their identity. And the idea is that our students have to take away is that we are all human. We are all the same. It's, it's not like you are different or I am different from, and we are different in our, in our ways, but at the end of the day, they're the same. But the people ask me, what is the impact? And yes, we have a survey. We have brilliant people. We have consultants. We have experts on who to gauge empathy and tolerance levels. But for me, the impact is a little different. For me, impact is when my student in Taukir Foundation in Nishad Colony comes up to me while we're Skyping with a person in India and asks me, sir, is it okay if I don't sit through this class? And I'm like, what is the problem? He's like, sir, I don't want to talk to an Hindu. And I'm like, is that the only problem? And he's like, she's also Indian. Well, <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, well, that's true. So yeah. So uh, I'm, and I, I had no choice, but I asked him, like, can we sit at the back and not take part in the conversation? And he was like, great, yes, let's do that. That sounds better. So we, we sat down at the back, and for the next 45 minutes, all the students connected with Disha over Skype for, and talked about Fawad Khan, how everyone in India was crazy about Khubsurat, the new movie, and Fawad Khan was the new jam and everything. And then what is biryani, how we love biryani and everything. So, you know, 45 minutes of true bonding, and, you know, they even asked questions like, why does uh, Gandhi wear dhoti? <laughs> Doesn't he have better clothes? And like, oh, well. <laughs> Uh, so then they'd be like, oh, Jinnah was so prim and proper. He wasn't, Gandhi was never proper. But this is the kind of conversation we wanted them to have, to have a more human connection, to talk about things that they are otherwise probably uncomfortable about talking. So at the end of the session, uh, Adnan, this guy who was sitting at the back with me, he came up and he's like, sir, can I ask a question from her? I was like, yes, done, job done. He wants to talk to her now. And he went up and he asked her that, uh, you say such good things about Pakistan, Muslims, you say that you love everyone and blah, blah, blah. But if that is all true, why have you banned the calling of Azan in India? And trust me, that took the color of my face away. And I was like, oh, what has happened? But she smiled at it without, honestly, without even constructing an answer, she smiled at, it and, at him and he, she was like, do you remember where I come from? He said, yes, you come from Bhopal. She's like, do you know what Bhopal is like? He's like, no, tell me about it. So she said that the most, the, it, it has a very huge Muslim population and there's a five time prayer that is called every day. And ever since I was young, my favorite part of the day was waking up to that azan and sitting through the azan and listening to the melody of azan every day and then sleeping after I'd after I, I had uh, heard the azan. And it was only today that I woke up to the same azan, and I don't know where in India azan is banned. So this is sort of the impact that I like to see. But uh, we try to f fight stereotypes and you know hate pyramids and everything. But on another note, we have some other impact too. We have reached 500 plus students and we have completed projects worth of 1.5 million, starting from the first project of 10,000 rupees in Karachi in one year, less than one year. And we've done programs in Karachi, Lahore, Gilgit, Baldistan, Skardu, and Hyderabad. And one more thing that my mom is most concerned about is how do you succeed in this? What, how do you make money out of this? What, what do you do? But well, money is not success for me, honestly. Uh, I know I don't want to sound like, oh, I'm, I live on the streets. I won't live on the streets, but money is not the measure of my success. And a lot of people expect me to say, oh, so you're going to say that you, you're saying that you want a tolerant, once the tolerant and empathetic Pakistan society is success for you. And I'm like, no, that is not success for me. If that was success, I'll be an unrealistic man. I know that today I won't have an impact. Tomorrow I won't have an impact. 10, days from, uh, 10 years from now I won't, have, I won't have an impact till the end of my life. But what is truly success for me is one life. One Sayyid Fayaz Hussain Shah who saved because of all the efforts of my life is success for me. Thank you so much.